Hey everyone, it's Hamish from the Young Investors Podcast. Myself and Brandon are excited to bring you your weekly rundown of the latest business and investing news from around the world. Now, a quick reminder before we get into the podcast is that nothing in this podcast should be taken on as personal financial advice. If you're ever unsure about your finances or investing, make sure you reach out to a qualified financial advisor. But with that said, let's get into another episode of the Young Investors Podcast. All right, guys, welcome back. Welcome back. We're back once again. We are. Where did we leave off with the last podcast? I can't quite remember. We are in Denver, weren't we? We were. We had just arrived in Denver. So we've been, we obviously spoke about Omaha last week. If you want to hear everything about our uh, Omaha trip, Berkshire, what Buffett was saying and all, uh, everything going on there, uh, then make sure you see last week's episode. Yep. Uh, and then, yeah, we were in Denver and uh, yeah, we can talk a little bit, a bit, I guess, today about Denver and where we are now. I'm kind of, I'm choking through this. <laughs> Denver's, <laughs> yeah, well, where we were in Denver, well, we, we both got a bit crook in Denver. Yeah. So. And, and I'm still a little bit sick. I'm sure you can probably kind of hear it in yeah. my voice. So um, yeah, our, our curse of travel continues. Yeah. Got sick We're, last um, time, got sick this time. I don't know, something in the air over here. Um, yeah, no, Denver was interesting. It was a bit of a sleepy town, really. Um, I yeah. Th- definitely next time, I think, if we go back, um, we should stay in Boulder, I feel like. Yeah, it seems like Boulder is like the cool younger brother of uh, Colorado. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> and it's like at the base of the mountains and then you can kind of go up from there. Because yeah. we, did, we did a one-day thing from Denver where we went out. Yeah. Uh, in a van and we went all the way up through the the rocky rocky mountain national park man it's so cool it's really it was really cool i really enjoyed that we went like i didn't expect to go up into into snow but we were right they really took us up there yeah uh, yeah i was surprised we actually went like quite far and yeah we were going to kind of organize our own thing and then at the end of the day we were just like we can't put together something good enough so we'll just we'll just book a tour yeah um worked out really and, uh, well. Yeah, I thought it was it good. It worked out well. We got to see, um, yeah, a lot. What do we, we went to Lily Lake first, yep. was our kind of first stop there. Um, Lion, and then we, the town. And, yep. Uh, yeah, we went to a little town. I can't remember exactly what the name of the town was. I think it was just Lion, wasn't oh, it? Lion Town. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, and uh, yeah, and then we went into into the national park and, and stopped a few places along the way. Man, it's scenic. It, yeah, it was interesting because like, if I, we both posted on Instagram, so go see some photos on Instagram if you're yeah. if you're interested. But the weather in the morning was really clear sky, so it was great. Yeah. And then it, as we kind of went up into the mountains, it was very <laughs> overcast. And there's some funny photos where you just can't see anything. It's yeah. just completely overcast. But it was kind of cool. It had like yeah. a cool feel to it. Cool um, vibe. Very yeah. Instagram. <laughs> yeah, e- exactly. Yeah, yeah. very like... 2014 Instagram or something. Like, you know? <laughs> nah, it was good fun though. I really enjoyed that. And then what yeah. else do we do? We didn't do too much else. We were just kind of, well, it was, it was raining, unfortunately for about three days yeah. straight, just like didn't stop. So that was yeah. a bit of a bummer. Um, so and we only had five days there, didn't we? Yeah. We so did. we kind of did do everything in those last kind of two days and it still wasn't, the weather wasn't the best, but um, no. But then uh, we kind of wrapped things up in in Colorado and mm. said bye bye. Hopped on a plane and we came did. came here. And now where are we here. now? We're in Las Vegas. Woo! <laughs> Viva Las Vegas, so, um, baby! Yeah, I've been telling everybody we've we've got every part of this trip. We had like the work, uh, yeah. nerdy Berkshire meeting, listening yeah. to investing. Then we had relaxation in in the mountains of Colorado. Yeah. And now we're at Vegas. Now we're in Vegas, <laughs> baby. This place, I've never been to Vegas before. I'm sure a lot of you guys, like a lot of you guys listening have probably been here before. This place is yeah. wild. It's crazy. It yeah. Is- I mean, I knew it was kind of insane, but yeah. it is uh, It is crazy. Like, yeah, like you were saying, it looks like someone's built the Las Vegas Strip, like a four-year-old has built the yeah. Las Vegas Strip. Like, That's the thing that blew me away because I was thinking, I was talking to Hamish about this earlier. It's just like, what what city in the world with all the you know council and approvals and that sort of thing? Yeah. What what sort of what sort of place where you go? Hey, I want to build like a, a mini New York and like a mini Paris, and I want to put it in the middle of the city. <coughs> like, mm. how many councils are like? Oh yeah, that's that. no, n- none of them. They're all like, oh no, you have to blend it in with the architecture of the area, and you, you have to make sure you only use these colors for ex- yeah. external cladding and these material. It's like yeah. in Las Vegas, it's like oh look, like literally just outside this window, it's a statue of liberty like what and then we walk down the strip and there's the eiffel tower the arc de triomphe like it is crazy it's so weird um and then you just got these massive just giant but we're we're at the mgm grand right now and what was the uber driver saying like second largest yeah yeah, second largest hotel in the world only after one in dubai so i think this hotel has it was just over six thousand rooms 
Wow. And the one in Dubai has like 10,000. But uh, yeah, it's second largest Insane. in the world. So yeah, it's massive. It's um, like these massive, massive casinos. And the other thing that's really uh, been really interesting is it's kind of like just one one thing leads into another. Like you mm. just like out of one casino and into the next. It's yeah. like almost hard. If you weren't like going over a bridge over a road, it'd be really hard to tell like where like one one casino ends and the next one begins because it's yeah. just continuous and you just walk through the strip and because yeah. a lot of the time you're not even walking along the road. You're like walking over sky bridges and stuff like that. And it's just, yeah, yeah it's a bit, it's a bit hectic. Yeah, we forgot to mention it. We thought it was pretty funny. We got off the plane uh, at the airport and there's just pokey machine or slot machines just immediately the moment you get off the plane like not even in the airport just yeah. immediately off like the first thing you see is uh it's slot machine yeah it's is, crazy it was I, I was literally i was like yeah i was really taking it was crazy just walking off the plane and there's just like gambling like right there in the yeah. airport i was like how is this like legal, but then I, don't, I guess Las Vegas, anything goes. Same yeah. thing like people smoking in the casino. Yeah, that one's Just like, oh, they're odd. inside. Like there's carpet yeah. on the floor, like carpet would catch on fire. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. I don't me. understand. That, that, that's pretty stupid. Yeah, I don't understand how that's happened because yeah. maybe I just don't know the rules over here, but in maybe it's just a Las Vegas special. Maybe it's not like that the rest of America, but in Australia, yeah. you're not smoking inside. You're not no, smoking in nowhere. a public- I don't think there's a- this is completely area. banned, right? I yeah. Think. There's yeah. no way you're smoking inside. Yeah. You'll yeah. get, yeah, chucked out. It's like, yeah, because I wonder how the, you know, <laughs> fire sprinklers don't go off. Just people. <sighs> yeah. How, how does it not just <laughs> beep, 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 beep. Yeah, that's actually true. That's, yeah, I don't yeah, know. It's very weird. Maybe they just don't have it. Maybe they have I don't know. America. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah, so I, I don't think uh, we don't really have that, that's pretty much it in terms of the we're not going to spend a huge portion of this podcast um, no, kind of no. talking about the trip. We'll, uh, we're going to get into some news and, and what's going on around the world as we yep. uh, typically do here on the Young Investors Podcast. Uh, probably the biggest thing that happened this week was we got the 13F filings yes. for US institutional investors. So we get to take a peek behind the curtains of uh, what Warren Buffett and Monish Pabrai have been uh, investing in or, or, or what stocks have been selling over the past three months. So We'll take a look at a bunch of different uh, 13F filings. And there was some uh, there was some interesting things in there that we can uh, both kind of point to. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had inflation data come in for the US. So we'll talk about that uh, briefly. What mm-hmm. else have we got? Um, I don't know. I thought maybe if we get time, we'll just talk quickly about the debt <coughs> ceiling. There's some stuff they're trying to figure that out over. Well, I was going to say they're trying to figure that out over in the States. <laughs> We're in the States. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then what are you, you're talking about uh, you, potentially if, if, Disney. If, if we've got, right? time, if we've got we'll, time, we'll talk about Disney earnings. Yeah, so, we, yeah. We, are, we are a little bit tight on time today. Um, it's yeah. been, that's the other thing with Vegas. It's been insanely busy. Well, the whole trip's been busy. Yeah. (laughs) It's just go, go, go. Like Denver was a little bit of a lull and now it's just like, go, 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 go. Like every single day, every, every minute of every day is like accounted for. So it's pretty hectic. Yeah. Um, But with that said, uh, let's get into it. So um, we will play you a little sponsor bit. And then after the break, we will come back and jump into what, Hamish? Should we start 13Fs or start inflation? Uh, Start with 13Fs. All right. Let's start with 13Fs. We'll see you in a second. Hamish and Brandon's Berkshire Bonanza 2023 is brought to you by Seeking Alpha. Try Seeking Alpha Premium today to access Seeking Alpha's rating system, valuation breakdowns, 10 years of financial data, unlimited news and analysis articles, plus have earnings call transcripts, investor presentations, SEC filings, and press releases all in the one place. With the suite of tools that come with Seeking Alpha Premium, you can be confident no matter what company you're looking at, you'll be able to get up to speed fast. But the best thing about our partnership is if you sign up with our referral link, you can access a 14-day free trial of Seeking Alpha Premium. So go check them out. Give Seeking Alpha Premium a go for yourself. And now let's get back to it. And we're back. All right. All right. Where do we go? Uh, Do you want to start uh, with the granddaddy himself? Yeah. All right. take, take it away. Mr. Warren Buffett, I didn't really uh, look too deeply into Mr. Warren Buffett's 13F because um, it wasn't particularly exciting. Uh, nothing. Oh, there was one talking point, which I'll, I'll get into. Uh, but before we get into actually the contents of his 13F, his portfolio, Hamish Hodder, is yep. now worth $325 billion. <laughs> That's big. So that was up and that was up. So 325 billion up from 299 billion in Q4 of last year. So one quarter, it's gone up quite a bit. Wow. And that's in a quarter where he was a net seller. He net sold $10.4 billion worth of equities. Interesting. Wow. So he's got some good gains in there. 
Yeah, yeah, it's been interesting. Yeah, it's kind of funny because I actually, um, just as a kind of a side tidbit, I actually hadn't looked at the S&P returns this year at all, really. Oh, yeah. Me, I, look, I looked at it the other day. I was like, me what, is the S&P even up or down? It's yeah. just been a funny year. What is I, it? Do you know? It's up about 10%. So it's oh, actually really? been quite a good year just generally. And I'm sure right. um, you know, Buffett's benefiting in, in part from that, just kind of everything getting pulled up. Yeah, true. Um, but then obviously his individual picks. But yeah, it was, it was just funny. It was literally this morning I was like, I haven't even looked at the S&P 500 yeah. this year. <laughs> well, that's the thing is that, and this is what all the content creators um, were talk. I was talking to Graham the other night yeah. um, at a dinner that I went to and we were just saying like, there's just not a lot to talk about this year. There's yeah. just not a lot making news. There's just not a lot no. going on. Yeah. And uh, like across the board, like finance content's not really being watched as much as what it was say last year. Cause it's just not, it's just a bit of a, as you go kind of year, like nothing crazy's happened either way. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we had the banking thing, but, 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 but definitely apart from that, besides yeah. that, yeah, that's, yeah. Besides the banking. Yeah. There's really been nothing kind of major that's yeah. going on. Um, well, nothing like really crazy or interesting. But no, yeah. no. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anyway, that was a bit of a side note. But yes, so talking about Warren Buffett. So yes, his equity portfolio went up quite substantially. Um, I'll just talk you through. So I'll, I, I, the screenshot I've put in this Google doc is every position that is more than 1% of his portfolio. How many are there? Three, six, nine, 10, I think 10, yeah. 10 positions that are more than 1% of his portfolio. <coughs> so out of those, uh, we'll start at the top. Apple, he added 2.28% to Apple. Mm -hmm. Bank of America added 2.25%. No change to American Express, Coca-Cola. And then we get to Chevron. He reduced 18.76% uh, mm. in Chevron. So he did actually cut that one uh, reasonably. Uh, and then Occidental Petroleum is next. He added 8.93%. Uh, Kraft Heinz, nothing. Moody's, nothing. Activision Blizzard. And this is probably the mm. one that we should talk about a little bit. Um, we definitely got the vibe from the shareholder meeting that Activision Blizzard might have been on the way out. Yeah. Because, of course, this is the arbitrage, kind of merger arbitrage play for Buffett um, that Microsoft was going to take over Activision Blizzard um, to bring them under their kind of gaming umbrella. And then, essentially, uh, the regulators got in the way. So, the FTC uh, in America and well, I forget what the UK one is. Uh, UK, I don't know off the top of my head. That's uh, all right. The UK regulators as well um, stepped in and said, no, we don't really want this deal going ahead. So it's a mm. little bit, it's still a bit iffy whether that deal gets done. It seems like it's becoming more of an uphill battle. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of Warren Buffett's thesis in a little bit of hot water. Like who knows if that's going to play out at this point. So we we're wondering yeah. whether, whether Warren Buffett was just going to say, you know, see you later. Happy with, you know, I just, I got to get out because I don't know, but it seems so far he's held on. Yeah. Cause it was funny. We spoke about this last week. It, it kind of, uh, he gave a, a pretty strong hint that he had sold it, which was, uh, yeah. the, just the way that he described it. Oh, you could see it in the financials or whatever he said. Yeah. He, oh, we're not going to disclose what we've done. Um, so yeah, it was interesting to see that he actually only reduced it by 6%. Yeah. Um, I don't actually know if I said that just before, but yes, he did reduce it by 6%. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I don't really know. Um, clearly, he's still... I guess he's just going to hang in there until the end. I guess if he was... I feel yeah. like if he was going to sell it because he was unsure about its outcome, he would have sold it. You would think he would just do it all in one... Because it is a... You know, it's only 1.3% of yeah, he the, the just, portfolio. So, it's actually a relatively small position. Yeah, it's um, 4.2 billion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> relatively small. 4.2 billion. <laughs> if I could be worth like... Emphasis on the relative there. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> relative. <laughs> so true. If I could be worth a tenth of that, I'd be I'd be pretty happy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I guess we'll see what happens. But I yeah. just don't think... I really do think that if he was going to sell, he would have sold it. So. I think so too. Yeah. Yeah. But we'll see, I guess. Yeah, we'll yeah. see. So that uh, that was Activision Blizzard, and then uh, yep. the last um, uh, the last stock that is more than one percent of his portfolio is HP, and he added fifteen percent. Do you know anything about HP? I really don't. No, I've never looked at the company. Um, no, a few people have kind of mentioned it to me, but it's never something I've really yeah. looked at deeply at all. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not even really sure. PHP is one of those businesses that's been split up and divested and oh, okay. a lot of few different times. So I'm actually not sure which part of HP that business is. Right. Okay. Um, interesting. But yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, hmm. 
Um, yeah, so that was Mr. Warren Buffett. Mm. Um, who should we talk about next? I think take us through Bury and then, uh, cause that's kind of the other okay. major one. And then I'll take us through kind of the other important names that have done okay. less uh, interesting things during the quarter. All right. Burry's was interesting, actually. Mm. Um, there were two main stories. So, you know, Burry, he's such a traitor. He's such a traitor. He's, <laughs> he's a traitor. No, not traitor. <laughs> traitor. <laughs> he's a traitor. <laughs> Trader, <laughs> no. Um, he actually did two interesting things. Again, I always curry cover Burry's thirteen F filings because it's interesting. Yeah. But yeah. I don't know how much you can take out of them. Oh, I, I think you can take out of it pure entertainment. Pure entertainment. Because every single quarter, <laughs> he deletes everything from yes, his portfolio and adds new things. <laughs> yeah, and it is great. No, but that's basically it. yeah. I don't, yeah, I think he bought seventeen. <laughs> I think seventeen <laughs> new stocks yeah. sold out. I can't it's it's funny because it's not even consistent either. No, like sometimes not. it'll be. Once he'll have one stock in the portfolio or like one US stock that we can yeah. see and like five call options. And then next week, yeah, it's like four stocks. And now it's 17 <laughs> yeah. new stocks. Like it's not even like he it's buys the same number of shares. No, nah, he's following. He's just in his own head. Um, so I won't go through the whole list of stuff no. um, because that'll just take way too long. Uh, but there are two themes. Uh, the first and probably the most reported on theme that I've seen out there is that he bought, yes, I said that correctly, he bought regional bank stocks, mm. um, which is an interesting mm. play because if you look in the media, <laughs> that's probably not what the media is is talking about doing. And, uh, and remember, this is, uh, you know, th- these are positions held at the end of the <clears throat> second quarter. Uh, the end, the end of, of the first, first quarter. quarter. End of so, March. Yep. Yeah, so this isn't tech- even now. You know, this is like 45 days ago. Yep. Uh, which the last 45 days for regional banks <laughs> has not been great. It's been a bit iffy. Um, so, let me, let me, let me, let me talk to you about it. Um, so, he bought New York Community Bank Corp. He bought Capital One. He bought Western Alliance. He bought PacWest, Huntington Bank Shares, and... Da, 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 First Republic. So, ouch on that one. Mm. Um, yeah, that's um, that's worth precisely zero dollars. Zip. <laughs> How, so, I don't know. Like, obviously, you just this is just like a- It's like a photo. It's a <clears> photo <throat> of their portfolio at a specific point in time. So, you don't actually know. Like, on the- What is it? The 1st of April, he could have done- Whatever. So who 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 That's knows from Michael Barry? So maybe he hasn't taken a hundred percent loss on the no. um, on the First Republic. He, he might have only lost ninety nine percent. Maybe <laughs> he got out. <laughs> just one holding bag. Damn, that sucks. Um, but to me, to me, I've I'm making a video about it. To me, this seems like a uh, a basket bet. Hmm. Um, so. I was reading a couple of forums, like a lot of people trying to figure out what's going on because they just, it seems a bit like, why is Michael Burry buying regional banks? It seems like he's going, you know what? I can't pick which regional bank is going to beat the others or which one's not going to have the bank run. So instead, let's just buy all of them as a basket bet because he th- and he said this on Twitter. He says like, I doubt this is a real crisis. You know, it seems very overblown. I think it will resolve very quickly. Yeah. So, and that's that's what he said on Twitter. So, I feel like he's just making this basket bet. Yes, maybe one or two have bank runs. Who knows? Because bank runs are just so psychological. Yes, yeah. obviously the banks that are, you know, having to sell assets to cover withdrawals. Yeah, maybe like oh gosh, but generally yeah. speaking, who who knows where the next bank run will be? Because it's all just psychological with depositors. But I think he goes, you know what? I can't tell which one of these is going to outperform the rest. I think all of them together as a group have been so trodden on, so beaten down that the risk reward might be there. Mm. That, you know, if he buys a basket, maybe one, I mean, one of them already has gone bust um, in First Republic, but maybe as a group, they all perform kind of like the cigar butt Benjamin Graham kind of approach. It's like if you find cigar butts with one puff left, you wouldn't, you wouldn't buy everything, put everything no. in, into that one cigar butt. But if you buy a diversified basket of cigar butts, then maybe on the whole, you come out slightly ahead. Yeah. And if you, you might remember, and some people might have seen this, he posted kind of a chart on Twitter talking about the uh, vulnerability, essentially, of uh, the different regional banks. And you had uh, those kind of two dimensions It was, it was was um, he was kind of looking at. But SVB and Signature, which were the first two to go, were way out well, on the-, the Outliers. On, 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 they were they? the outliers. And then even First Republic was a bit more of an outlier than even the rest of the regional banks, although it wasn't as far as the other two. Uh, I just said one- uh, First, yeah, Republic, First Republic. Yeah, yeah, First yeah. Republic. Um, 
So yeah, it is interesting. He was assuming that's kind of his thesis. It's that those banks were in, you know, a fairly unique position. Uh, and yep. then, yeah, what, you, what everything that you just said, yeah, buying kind of a basket to benefit from the fact that everything is kind of, everything in regional banking is getting pulled down by the uncertainty that potentially there's there's <clears> more <throat> banking failures in that area. Yeah. We're also talking off air, we were talking before about like what else could he be doing? Because there were a couple of people in the forum saying that he's actually betting against the banks. And I was like, ah, oh, I, d- right. I don't think so. Um, because there were people saying that it could be some sort of hedging for an options play that he was doing. However, at the same time, the options do get reported and having a look at the total 13, he he didn't have any options at the end of the quarter. So I think that thesis goes out the window. And then the other, yeah. sorry. I, we, I was going to say, yeah, I'm, I'm, no, I'm certainly no expert on that, but from my understanding, which is, you know, I have somewhat of reasonable understanding, I don't understand how that could possibly be the case. No, but, no. Um, but yeah, if someone has a, a good reason why that's not the case, then feel free to let us yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the other the other thing, uh, the other story that was flying around is that maybe he was covering a short. Yeah. Um, so obviously you sell the stock first, then you have to buy it back. Yeah. So maybe he was actually betting that the bank stocks were going down. So he's, he's borrowed someone's shares and sold them immediately. And now this is popping up in his portfolios, him buying back the shares now that they've gone down heaps. But honestly... Um, I don't, I don't know. This is where we were kind of saying, look, I don't, I don't know, but for, for me, the way I understand it is that if you're covering a short, that, that transaction just happens immediately. Like there's not a situation where some of the stock sits in your portfolio and then you kind of pay it back that way. Yeah. Yeah. The the fact that this is, you know, this is a snapshot. This isn't uh, a transaction list of purchases. This is a snapshot of his portfolio. So it would be pretty unlikely, I think, that it just so happened that the quarter rolled over as he held yeah. the shares that he was going to then give back as a, to close the short position. Well, I don't even know if that's how it works. Surely you just click a button, like close your yeah. short position, and then it goes, okay, yeah. done. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but then again, the point that you raised, which I think is valid, is that once we get into these like top dog investors, the way that they interact with brokers is definitely more custom and yeah. not quite as standardized as like how we interact with brokers no, no. where we so, just get to click buttons. So maybe yeah. there's some sort of magic yeah. going and, and, on. And but- all of those kind of unique uh, contracts that uh, institutional investors put together with banks, uh, we don't really see any of that in the 13F. So we're not privy to the details of that. So if Mr. Burry wants to tell us exactly what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> At Cassandra, <laughs> then, uh, please let yeah, us know. Please let us know. But otherwise we're kind of in the dark. Yeah. Um, um, and I'll just fly through the, the other. So that was the first big story for Michael Burry. And then the second big news story um, was that he bought more Chinese tech, which is interesting. Mm. So uh, these are now the, the biggest two positions in his portfolio, JD.com at 10.26% and Alibaba at 9.56%. So this is interesting because uh, Q4 last year is when they first popped into his portfolio. And that was also the same time kind of COVID policies relaxed. So, you know, Michael Burry, value investing mind, but, you know, he's a bit of a trader. We were thinking maybe he's just trading in maybe a swing with the with the whole yeah. reopening of China and then he was going to bounce out. Yeah, he's, a, he's definitely a value investor, but he does love to consider macroeconomic factors in, yeah. his, in his thesis. So that sure. made perfect sense. Yeah. yeah. So I was expecting them to be gone. Yeah. I was like, okay, open back up. Sure, maybe, maybe I don't even know, actually, I don't think those stocks bounced very much. Maybe slightly, but I don't think very much. Yeah. Um, I'd actually have to check that. So I thought they were going to be gone, but... Um, Nevertheless, we come back and another quarter's passed and instead of selling, he has uh, added quite substantially. So he added 233% to his JD.com position and 100%. So he doubled his Alibaba position. Yeah. So, significant. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you can never really know with Michael Burry, but <laughs> it's certainly the first step into thinking a little bit longer with these positions. So I don't know if he's actually bullish on China or whether it's still just like a... Like how long is he realistically going to hold these for? Like I don't know. Is he is is this the start of like a five to ten year? Because you know, it's been a while since uh, Mr. Burry's held a held a position for more than six months. Yeah, so, uh, I don't know. It looks like he's backing China a little bit more, but then again, it is Michael Burry, so I just don't have any faith that he's going to hold these for a long time. No, <laughs> and, and then the kind of overall thing I guess to remember with Burry is that I think most of the assets under management are not shown in the thirteen F. Yeah, I think this was about thirty percent off. Yeah. Top 
off my head of his total assets under management. So uh, remember that, you know, we're saying, you know, he's got 20% in total between JD and Alibaba. Um, that's 20% of a third. So yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, not, you know, yeah. we're still kind of looking at a tiny piece and we don't know. He could have massive short positions, international positions, cash, property, bunch of, you know, commodities. So yeah. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's Bury's a uh, yeah. He's a bit of a closed <laughs> book when it comes to yeah. his actual portfolio. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, yeah, I think his his oh, what was his portfolio size? Oh, I wonder if I can find it very very quickly. But m- 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 Michael Burry, there it is. His portfolio size is one hundred and seven million. And if you just look back to Q1 of 2022, his portfolio size was 165 million. So it's not like he's lost that money. Yeah. It's just he's taken it out of the market. I don't actually know what his total assets uh, under just, management just are. Just looking at it now. Because I don't uh, know if it ever gets to, reported. It does. It only gets reported. Uh, so as of the end of March uh, this year, his uh, total assets under management was 240 million. Oh. So uh, that represents uh, what, about a half? Yeah, of le- yeah, slightly less than half. Yeah. 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 So there you go. There you go. That's Michael Burry for you. That's Michael Burry. Um, who knows? All- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> who knows? In summary, who knows? Yeah. He, uh, he, he, Tweeted some stuff, then he del- actually deleted his Twitter uh, again, which again. He, he does occasionally. He'll it's, be back. Yeah, but and no, no, and then he came back. Oh, he, he came, came back a couple back, weeks okay. later. So oh, I, don't, okay. I don't know what that deal was, but um, yeah, he's a he's a bit of a wild card. <laughs> he's so. a, he is a wild card. <laughs> All right, Hamish, let's, uh, uh, let's move on. Yeah, let me talk about some of the other thirteen Fs. That your two stories there were probably the most interesting, I think. So I'm glad okay. we kind of fleshed those out, and I'll go relatively quickly through some of the other names that um, we kind of like to look at. Li Lu uh, made a couple of minor changes, a, a slight increase in his stake in Bank of America, oh, okay. uh, which is his uh, largest position. And um, of course, uh, Warren Buffett has quite a large position in Bank of America as well. It's a fairly popular one among value investors. Uh, he also decreased his position in uh, Micron slightly, which was interesting because Monish Prabhai, his friend, also uh, reduced mm. his position in Micron. So those two tend to collaborate i think on on i think they actually did collaborate on micron so yep. um it's not really surprising i guess to see that they both decided to to sell at the same time yeah um seems like they probably i can't didn't. remember whose idea it was do you remember i, can't remember. I think it was lee lu's oh no actually i think it was monish's idea monish's idea yeah. and then lee lu was like yeah you're right about yeah. micron yeah i think i think that's how it went mm. yeah um, at least that's how Monish told the story. <laughs> it was my idea. <laughs> my idea. And then Lee Lu was like, Monish, Lee Lu was you reluctant. The- but yeah. no. And then I convinced him and he made so much money. He was like, <laughs> Monish, you are the best guy. I tell you, you are the best investor. My God. Yeah. I got, I got to give you a bonus, man. Yeah, pretty no. much. No, no. <laughs> um, uh, Monish also added to his Brookfield corporation, uh, position, uh, which I believe is an asset management company. Yeah, I think so. It's, yeah, again, not a, none of these businesses are ones that I've really looked into in any detail. Yep. Um, and when it comes to Monish, most of his investments are outside of the US, which we can't see. Um, so we know from what he said that most of his investments are outside of the US, but yep. um, so that's how we know that, but we, yeah. we can't see the rest, unfortunately, yep. um, which is the case with you know some of these investors. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. One um, uh, one interesting kind of uh, one I saw there was uh, Nelson Peltz, uh, which if that name sounds familiar to you, uh, was uh, the investor who took a $1 billion position in Disney oh, and then uh, right. released a, a scathing report of uh, the Disney management team and uh, basically saying they're, they'd overpaid for the Fox acquisition. Their streaming strategy was terrible. He basically wrote, I think it was like a 25 or 30 page presentation on why the management team had been making a lot of mistakes. Yeah. And then he pushed for a seat on the board. So he was really taking a kind of an activist uh, investor position where he kind of, you know, invested significantly yeah. into the company and then pushed for a seat on the board. And this was recently, wasn't it? I, this we, was recently. We spoke about this not too long ago. Yeah. So this was, so he actually initiated that billion dollar position in the last 13 F. So last quarter. Right. So, okay. Uh, just a quarter ago, he, yeah, first invested into Disney. Uh, and so the news this quarter is he's actually sold a third of his Disney position. Right. So, um, uh, you know, since then he was unsuccessful in getting a seat on the board. Disney Damn pushed it. back with their own uh, presentation, uh, you know, <laughs> their own PowerPoint, clapping back with a number of claims. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so it will be interesting to see if he actually ends up just completely selling the position because obviously yeah. 
you wouldn't just acquire the stock just to get a seat on the board if you didn't love other aspects of the business. So he obviously thinks it has the potential to be a reasonably good investment. But uh, yeah, I, I wonder if uh, I wonder what he's going to do. Yeah, who that knows? Position yeah, going forward. Yeah, yep. Uh, a few other names here. Bill Ackman uh, made some changes. He added Google to his portfolio, uh, actually a 10% position now. So quite a significant one, uh, a little over a billion dollars in his uh, in his little $10 billion portfolio. I shouldn't say little. It's a, it's a, it's a significant portfolio. Sorry. That's Bill. That's, I feel almost feel bad about talking like Michael Burry because his portfolio is, is what? 200 uh, assets 240, under, yeah, yeah. 240 million. <laughs> and then these guys are managing billions and billions of dollars. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting. Yeah, it is. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, there's nothing really, there's, none of those things are really particularly, there's nothing really to dive into too much. I mean, Bill Ackman's position in Google is really, I would imagine, a, uh, a move on uh, AI, on, on AI. Yeah. Um, you know, we don't really know. I don't think Bill's actually said anything specifically about that. Yep. Um, and then we had uh, who sat on their hands, who did nothing. Uh, Norbert Lou did nothing. Guy Spear did nothing yet again. Guy Spear does nothing yeah, <laughs> for the last few quarters. He was which too is, busy. Yeah. And uh, Charlie Munger uh, yeah. did absolutely nothing. Classic. Through the Daily Journal portfolio. So, Classic. Um, yeah. It's a, it's a feature of value investors. It's not uncommon to see nothing done on a quarterly, yearly basis. Mm -hmm. I did nothing this quarter. Yep. I just <laughs> yeah, I did nothing. I haven't done anything for a while. Yeah. Um, no, it's actually true. If you see them doing nothing, most of the times that's that's yeah. a good it thing. It comes out sounding like a criticism, but it's not. Like, it's oh, not. These guys did nothing. They they did no, it's actually- it's What did almost you do this quarter? Nothing. Nothing. What? Show up, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but it's good. Yeah, it's good. It is, yeah. Yep. Um, you think about punch card style investing, like what Warren Buffett says. You only got yeah. 20 punch cards. You only got 20 punches in your punch card. Yep. So you got to use them wisely. Exactly right. Um, exactly right. All right, and they are the 13 Fs, right? Yeah. Um, where do you want to take us next? You talk about this uh, inflation data. Yes. It's coming so, down. Uh, it is coming down. Uh, <laughs> inflation continues to improve in the US. Uh, so the headline number came in at 4.9% year over year, which is uh, we're in the fours. We're in the four percent. Yeah, I reckon. Which is, uh, which, which is good. And um, yeah, of course, comes after the Federal Reserve has now done 10 consecutive rate hikes. <laughs> wow. Which is, uh, yeah, it's quite impressive how quickly they've raised rates and uh yeah it seems to be having uh you know reasonable impact on on inflation which has come down from nine percent in the middle of last year to now just under five percent yep um yeah it was the headline number was expected to be five percent so it came in just below expectation and it's the lowest annual pace since april of 2021 so come back uh, down we've reversed the last two years of uh of inflation essentially wow there you go great I, I always find this is crazy to me <laughs> like i don't know i don't quite know what the psychological phenomenon is for this but like if you shown us that number two years ago, we would be like, oh my God, no, the sky is falling. And now we're like 4.9%. And we're like, yes, <laughs> yeah. come on. That's so low, man. That's so low. Yeah. <laughs> it's like still doubled the target rate. That's the thing. I think, I think that's the thing to keep in mind is, yeah, it is great, but it's still a long it's way still, from target. I mean, high. US's target is 2%. Yeah. Australia's target is 2 to 3%, but that's generally the consensus yeah. is kind of low single digit, very low single digit uh, inflation. But yeah, 5% is still two and a half times target. So it's still way too hot. If it stays at 5% for the next two, three years, that would be that be that would be bad for people. Yeah. Um, you don't want the cost of living rising five percent every single year, especially yep. when uh, wages are very unlikely to they keep, up, keep with up that. Yep. Uh, on wages, actually, before I, uh, I'll, I'll come back to the some of the details of inflation, but um, real wage growth year over year was continues to be negative, negative point five percent. Right. But in April, real wages actually grew. Whoa. Point one percent, which is uh, I think it's the first time real wages have grown in a long time. Yeah. So real wages meaning uh, after considering inflation. Yeah. So um, that's obviously very, Jeez, very good news. Can't be having that. <laughs> What's going on there? Can't be having people making more no. money than the cost of living rising. Jeez. <laughs> no. Oh my gosh. Absolutely so, unacceptable. Someone, someone's accidentally added another zero yeah. on their pay rise. That can't oh be right. Oh my gosh, no, no, we'll have to review that. Yeah, Jesus. Employees' rights, they get worse over time, not better. Yeah. What are they talking oh, about? Well, no, it is, it is good. 
it is good to actually see. Well, I mean, it's 0.1%. It's like nothing. But I mean, yeah, it's, it's not negative. Again, it's, it's it not negative. comes back to what you said. It's yeah. like, yeah, we got 5%, but it's not nine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not negative 0.5. Yeah. We actually went somewhere. Um, um, so in terms of what was kind of pushing inflation around, uh, the food category was flat month over month. Uh, again, that's surprising or not surprising, but um, a, a welcome slowdown from the you know massive increases that have been happening in food. Uh, food at home actually declined 0.2%. So for those out there who love uh, ordering Uber Eats and stuff, probably mm-hmm. not Uber Eats, but maybe everything else, <laughs> Uber Eats seems to continue to get expensive. Yeah. Uh, energy was up 0.6% month over month, which is actually quite um, a, a substantial increase. And it was interesting, uh, gasoline was up 3% for the month, but fuel oil was down 45 and they kind of balance each other out. So, right. Um, but yeah, you get to kind of see how volatile energy can be. Core inflation, which removes food and energy, rose 5.5%. So core inflation is actually now above overall inflation because the food and energy categories are in in decline over year over year. mm, Makes sense. Um, Mostly energy is is, uh, negative year over year. Yep. Uh, Core inflation month over month was 0.4%. And the biggest contributor was used cars up 4.4% for the month. So... um, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, certainly, a big slowdown in uh, a large part of the slowdown in inflation is energy being negative. So, if you if you t- look at everything else outside yeah. of energy, uh, especially year over year, like food and and, and cars and, and transport and that sort of thing, everything is still up very high. A lot of them are actually very close to double digits. So, yeah, um, it is it is kind of a it's it's more than just the the surface level number. I think um, having inflation under five percent is great, but uh, if only fuel is you know or, or gasoline is negative 20 percent, and everything else is plus you know six percent seven percent then it, that's still an issue yeah um and it, it's entirely possible that uh y- you know it's interesting because a lot of people are saying well look all, all the rate hikes are working the inflation's coming down but if a lot of the slowdown in inflation is just from energy which you could say is kind of supply bottleneck driven maybe yep. interest rate hikes might not actually have that much of an impact on Uh-oh. on that um yeah. Then, uh, yeah, we'll, see what uh, with it. we'll kind of see um, what happens. Yeah. But yeah, core inflation has been quite a bit more resilient. So hopefully, mm. it, um, hopefully it comes down. Fingers crossed. I hope so. I'd just like to get back to normal. Just like yeah, normal. Just get, you know, just a couple, a little bit. I mean, it's not good for content if everything's normal. <laughs> but but like as as a real person, I'd quite like everything to just be pretty yeah, chill just, for a just, while. Just chill just out. Just relax, everybody. Take a deep breath. Yeah. Um, anything else to talk about with inflation there? Or? No, that's it. That's no, it. Uh, we are pretty much done. Okay. Well, Hamish, how long have we got? Maybe got 10, a, 10 minutes or so? About 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, I'll just fly <laughs> through this. This is just a quick bit of news. I don't have too much to add on this bit of, of news, which has been hotly discussed recently. Um, the debt ceiling might be being raised next week in America. So mm. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is optimistic that congressional negotiators could reach a deal to raise or suspend the debt ceiling. Just suspend it. Just nah, stuff it. <laughs> get rid- just get rid of it. Um, well, most, most places don't actually have a debt no, ceiling. No, they don't. I don't think Australia has a debt ceiling. No, so, yeah. Or at least it's so high that... We never get anywhere near it. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm actually not sure. I don't think we do. I don't think we have. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, uh, he, the House Speaker is optimistic that congressional negotiators could reach a deal to raise or suspend the debt ceiling in time to hold the first vote on it next week. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy said Thursday he's optimistic that... Wait a second. Did I just put the same thing in twice? No, the article is basically saying the same thing twice. Um, he says, I'll cut to what he said. I see a part, I see the path that we can come to an agreement, Aww. McCarthy told reporters. Amazing. What? <laughs> an agreement, um, told reporters in the Capitol. Quote, and I think we have a structure now and everybody's working hard. And I mean, we're working too. Wow. Two or three times a day, Hamish. They're working. <laughs> <laughs> That's literally what it says. It's, I think we have a structure now and everybody's working hard. I mean, we're working two or three times a day and then going back getting more numbers. Wow. Imagine having to work like two times a day, Hamish. Oh my gosh. Wow. Imagine having to think about work Ma- oh, twice a day. Oh, jeez. <laughs> two times. 
He's used his brain twice. <laughs> That's too, too many for two a politician. Brain signals. <laughs> God <laughs> damn. No wonder this uh, hasn't gone through yet. Yeah, no wonder. Oh, man. that If we went on an unhinged like podcast about how little politicians <laughs> do, I don't know if we'd get like applause or if we'd get cancelled. I think we'd get applause. I think we'd probably get applause, but maybe that's a topic for maybe yeah, another day. We'll save that. For we'll save, that day. save that for a day where we've got a lot of time to talk. Yeah. Um, okay. Where was I? Investors have been watching Washington closely this week for any signs of progress in the months-long debt limit standoff. While House negotiators huddled with McCarthy's team in the Capitol complex Thursday, continuing their efforts to hammer out a deal that needs to pass the Republican majority House and the Democratic controlled Senate ahead of the potential uh, June 1 deadline, the sooner state the Treasury, uh, yeah, June 1 deadline, the sooner state the Treasury could run out of cash to pay its debts already incurred. Uh oh, Mm. time to make a. Uh, a video, US going bankrupt. <laughs> Just, I think I already did that one. <laughs> did you? <laughs> yeah. But it's so funny because like, there's, there's no way. There's no way they let it. There's no way. I mean, yeah, it's pretty unlikely. It's I think. so unlikely, man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, remember what Buffett was talking about at the Berkshire meeting. He's yeah. like, guys, there's so much media driven fear. It's like, you know, we've got a debt ceiling. We're going to raise it, you know? Yeah. It's just, it's like, do we just raise the debt ceiling slightly or do we cause absolute chaos throughout the whole global financial system? Yeah. I yeah. think they just raise the debt ceiling. Like, it seems like the easier way to do it. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, if you look, there's a good Vox video on this actually where you can kind of see how many times this is an issue. Uh, it does come up a lot. I think the last time was like last year or two years ago. Yeah. So this does happen. Um, you know, it, it happens every couple of years, so it's it's um it's fine. It it seems scary, but it is it tends to work itself out because yeah, the, the otherwise the consequence is pretty bad. Uh, if they do end up defaulting, yeah. then there could be some severe consequences for you know the confidence in in the currency. But gosh, um, June first, I'm already seeing the thumbnails. Like <laughs> you remember how it was like China going bankrupt? Without everyone was like 25 days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> 14 days 14 left. 14 days left and then the US is no more. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Um, I'll, I'll save that one for later. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Might uh, actually use that one. It's quite good. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't you dare. Um, okay. McCarthy declined to give reporters any new details about exactly what's being discussed behind closed doors. He said, quote, I don't think it's productive if you go uh, write something and then everyone who is just not in the room gets mad over things. I believe, uh, I just believe where we were a week ago and where we are today is just a much better place because we've got the right people in the room discussing it in a very professional manner. Well, that's always good. People mm. are doing their jobs, Hamish. Well done. Um, they're it, it, discussing in a very professional manner with all the knowledge, all the background from all the different leaders. McCarthy, all the different leaders. All of, all them, of them. Every single one of them, Hamish. <laughs> um, setting aside partisan rhetor- rhetoric, uh, McCarthy took time to praise the White House team on Thursday. Quote, I have the greatest respect for Shalanda and for Ricchetti. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce their names. Apologies if it's not. They are exceptionally smart, tough. They are strong in their beliefs on the Democratic side, just as who, just as who we have in the... Just as what? Just as who we have in the room. Okay, cool. Mm. Um, praise, praise, praise. Well, uh, they're working through through it in a very professional manner, seeing where we can be. A- this guy, how does he speak? Seeing where we can be able to raise the debt ceiling, taking concerns of what the house has and others to put a bill together that will become law. Man, can this guy thanks, speak? Thanks McCarthy. Can can thanks guy- for saying absolutely nothing. <laughs> yeah. But can he just speak in like sentences that make sense, please? Yeah, what a disaster. <laughs> anyway, Jesus. so neither here nor there. So there you go. I guess we'll, we'll yeah we'll find out next week if yeah. uh, if it's if it's been raised. So or they're not. optimistic that they can get it done next week. We'll see if it happens or not. Yeah. It is. Uh, there you go. Do you think it's going to happen next week? I mean, I, I guess. You know? I, I don't yeah, know. I, I, I guess um, so. Probably. Who knows? Probably. <laughs> I mean, either that or uh, 31 days, mate. <laughs> I don't yeah. even know. Tick tock. Tick tock. No, what, what did I say? It's June. Oh, June the 1st. Oh, that's actually very close. Hey. Mm. May. Yeah, June. So. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thir- thirteen days. Thirteen there it is. days. Watch out for that thumbnail, everybody. <laughs> thirteen days till ultimate destruction. <laughs> fire, fire in the thumbnail. Um, okay, Hamish. Right. Let's uh, let's let's talk Disney earnings very quickly. Yeah, um, let's do it real quick. Yep. Uh, so uh, yeah, this this is kind of news from last week, uh, but I thought it was interesting to include because I noticed that the stock had fallen ten percent. 
uh, after earnings, which is a you know fairly significant decline uh, for for a company the size of Disney. Mm-hmm. Uh, they reported revenue of twenty one point eight billion dollars, which was up thirteen percent year over year. Thank you very much. Sounds pretty good. It does. Um, yeah, where did it come from? Disney Parks Experiences revenue was up right. 17% year over year, yep. uh, which was on increased volume in customer spending. So yep. people keep going back. They're back. People keep going back to parks and uh, and and cruises and all the, all of those mm-hmm. kinds of things. Uh, their Disney media segment was up just 3%. So it kind of lagged a little bit. Yep. And to get into the media segment, which is, uh, of course, the, the majority of their business, uh, Linear Networks was negative 7%. So their linear business continues to uh, face uh, declines. Uh, that was kind of offset by direct-to-consumer, which was up 12%. And they also had content sales and licensing, which was up uh, 18%. Right. Uh, and that increase is mostly on the back of increased theatrical revenue. So oh, okay. um, they released- uh, More movies. Uh, Avatar was uh, at the top of the list for- oh, of course. Uh, producing a lot of revenue i think it was i think i don't know where it sits on the grossing list at the moment for all time but it's got to be oh it'd be high it's got to be up there but then again Um, they spent so much on it as well they did and that was interesting that you mentioned that because uh their content sales and licensing business actually lost money oh my gosh so so revenue was up 18 percent yeah but they lost money and a part of that is because they're continuing to do less licensing and just putting stuff on their direct to consumer platform. So yep. they're producing, uh, yeah. So they're spending an enormous amount of money on these shows, getting some back with theatrical release, but then they're not getting the kind of the back end of that revenue stream, which they normally get, which would be to license it to cable networks and to, and, yep. and so on and so forth. So, right, okay. um, yeah, it was interesting. <clears throat> so that, that was kind of a loss for them. Uh, a direct to consumer of, of course was also still, uh, a loss. Um, and uh, in terms of their uh, linear uh, business uh, income, uh, so I said their revenue declined 7%, uh, operating income declined 35%. Ouch. So um, yeah, the media segment is it kind of in shambles at the moment. Um, yep. The only segment that's actually profitable is going down very, very quickly, mm. um, which is you know not surprising why the stock fell considerably. Uh, and then just quickly on their streaming business specifically, of course, they're not profitable yet, but they are continuing to grow their streaming business on a revenue basis and, and try and reach a kind of a profitable scale position. Yep. Uh, Disney Plus subscribers was 157.8 million, mm-hmm. which was down 4 million subscribers quarter over quarter. Yes. So uh, they lost a lot of subscribers and that was probably the headline that um, some of you might have seen. Their US subs were flat. Um, so it's been pretty consistent among the, the streaming services the the media companies yep uh all of the losses came from disney plus hotstar which is their indian disney plus business right so they raised prices and lost um, oh kind of interesting four million subscribers there oh i wonder if they're net positive <clears throat> if that's like a net positive change that they've made i didn't actually look yeah. at that i don't know if they'd uh, even comment on it i i, I couldn't that, tell you maybe they wouldn't was. even comment but that yeah it's yeah. An interesting like it because then if they're making more money they lose four million subscribers but they make more then it's like hmm yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that seems to be their con- their strategy because uh, they raised their Disney Plus prices by twenty percent in the US. So they didn't see sub growth, but they were able to raise prices twenty percent. Okay. So, um, there it seems as though they're kind of now instead of chasing just additional subscribers, they're now looking to raise prices and just increase overall revenue, yep. um, rather than kind of chasing additional subscribers. Yeah. Um, um, also, one thing I just wanted to touch on. Um, almost like a little mini lesson is that um, when it comes to these massive capital intensive companies, I feel like this, it's always, I think it's just the way of the financial media. They always talk revenue. I don't Hmm. understand why they always talk revenue, but they do. Well, I guess they talk net income as well, but I feel like it's always like the first thing you read is like revenue was up, revenue was up, revenue was up. But this is like a classic example of where, you know, (coughs) revenue might go up whoop-de-doo. And then you look at their operating income and it's like, Oh my yeah. God. It's like you look at Tesla's revenue or something and then you look at their operating income and you're like, wow, it's a big number up there. It's a very small number there. So yeah. I think definitely more emphasis needs to be on yeah, op- their operating income. How much money does the business actually make yeah. <laughs> from from running yeah, especially its Especially now because with the environment we're in, most businesses are seeing revenue increase because it's an inflationary environment. So most businesses are increasing revenue at some degree, yeah. but it's the profitability that's suffering because the business's costs are going up so much. So, yeah. 
Um, yeah. yeah, it is. A, it is interesting. Definitely a good thing to remember um, is to cut through whenever you see revenue in uh, in the financial media, cut through that and get yeah. to net income or operating income. Look at the income. details. Look, Look at, at the, the profitability. Yes. Um, is that everything for you? Want to talk anything else on Disney? No, that's um, that's no? pretty much all I had for it. That's so, it. Um, okay. Yeah. We better bounce. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, we're uh, we're kind of on a <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're kind of on a tight schedule. We uh, are on a tight. We still got a fifty minute podcast in. I'm surprised at that. We still yeah. did pretty well. We yeah. were we were really running out of time today. So um, yeah. yeah, that we will cut it there because we do have to head off. But yeah, hopefully you guys still enjoyed today's episode. There was actually still a fair bit to talk about, especially yeah. with all those thirteen Fs. Yeah. Um, but I won't get it. Let's not ramble. Don't ramble, Brandon. <laughs> um, we will get to Q&A next week. Um, so if you have any Q&A questions, just head to the YouTube version of this podcast, the most recent version, um, and drop us a comment, ask a question. You can also ask over on Spotify. We do have some questions. Did we get to them last week? We didn't do any last week. Either, I think so. We? No, we've, no, we've got a backlog. We'll, we'll, yeah, <laughs> so we'll, we will get to them. Please keep sending them in. We haven't forgotten about them. We'll, yeah. we'll get we'll get back to them, but it's just, uh, yeah, these are kind of a, a, f- a few special episodes. But with yeah. that said, thank you guys for watching. We'll see you guys next week. See you guys.